All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Faith Library Podcast. This is Aaron. And I want to say thank you so much for supporting us by liking us on Facebook, by subscribing to our YouTube channel, which is Faith Library PH, and also our Spotify and Apple Podcast, which is Faith Library. And we had a wonderful discussion last time with our guest with Pastor Ramen Kaliwag about the Reformation. And you can also watch that in our videos in our archive. But for this time, I'm really excited because this is a month in the making. And I've been really excited to schedule my in my phone, on my laptop. Everything's been scheduled. I'm really excited. I woke up early this morning because we're going to have a special guest tonight. And he's a well-known debater and an apologist. Maybe you've seen him in his documentary, which is How to Answer the Fool. And we're going to talk about that tonight. Our guest for tonight is Saiten Bergenkate. Saiten, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Yeah. By the way, my whole last name is Ten Bergenkate. So uh, if you leave the, the Bergenkate off, and that's only part of my last name. But part of the reason I'm doing this is because you got a really cool last name. <laughs> yeah. yeah you're, 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 you, you just got to add an E to it, and then, and then we'd be on the same page. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because my last name in the Philippines, it's a Chinese uh, surname. But it's yours. It's, I think it's a Dutch. Uh, it is. Actually, my, my name is spelled in Holland is S-I-J-E. But the I-J in Holland are, are a Y with two dots on it. They don't have that letter here. So they just, they just said S-Y-E. But here, I'll, I'll let a secret into your viewers that not a lot of people know. Sai is actually my middle name. It's not my first name. Oh, so what's the first name then? My first name is Roland. R-O-E-L-A-N-D, but my parents called me by my middle name my entire life. So that's a little nugget just for your viewers. Oh, so we have to call you Roland Seid and Bergenkate. That's the whole name. Yeah, or in Dutch, in Dutch it's Roland Seid Bruggenkate. Oh, so, much cooler. It's a mouthful. Yeah, it's a mouthful. But, but that's why I'm, I'm happy and honored uh, to, be, to share with you this episode of the show. And I'm going to ask you, where are you? I think you're in a different place in the typical... <laughs> your typical place in studio well I, I think the best way for me to show you um uh, where i am is to bring another face into the picture here <laughs> for sure man Th this face this face i just sneezed so he might he might want to he might want a second to uh, don't worry it's only it's only the coronavirus no big deal <laughs> <laughs> that's my uh, my dear brother eric hovind and you could see a lot uh, of him on the film on my film how to answer the fool debating delahunty uh, eric uh, makes a cameo but I'm in his studio in Pensacola, Florida. That's why actually things look a lot better than my studio. But I was speaking at a conference in Vero Beach, Florida, and I wasn't going to be able to make it back in time to do this interview. And Eric graciously allowed me to use his studio. So I'm sitting in here with my dear brother, Eric Hoban, in Pensacola, Florida. And tomorrow I head back to the place I'm staying, Port Arthur, Texas. But in between here and there, there's a hurricane. So I have to make sure I make that trek before the hurricane hits. But it's not till tomorrow evening. And uh, it's actually an evening here in Pensacola. Um, it's what eight o'clock our time yeah. and nine in the morning for you. So yeah, so we pray, we will be praying for you in that on your journey uh, towards home. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, maybe Eric's gonna hear this, but I hope that Eric, I can invite him to the show. Fingers crossed. Oh, you can you can invite him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you can join us. Now. Yeah, I'm gonna put his schedule. Yeah. <laughs> So, Sai, uh, since you've, no, you've been a no, well-known debater and at the same time you're an apologist, uh, can you give us a short journey in your Christian life? How did you become a Christian and how did you come across presuppositional apologetics in the, in the place of where you are today? Sure. Um, the first question is a very easy one for me. I don't know how I became a Christian. I was born and raised in a Christian home and I don't know when I was saved. Now, I'm not saying that I was born a Christian but I don't know when God saved me. Now, there are people out there who say, if you don't know when you're saved, then you're not a Christian. And I normally ask them, when did you start loving your mother? And if they can't tell me when they started loving their mother, then I'd say, well, I guess you don't love your mother. But uh, Doug Wilson also came up with this analogy. He says, imagine that you were saved from drowning when you're 20 years old. It'll make it on the six o'clock news. I mean, that's quite some news. But imagine your parents took you to swim lessons every week for your entire life. And then that person who was saved from drowning when he was 20 said, well, you can't swim because you were never saved from drowning on the six o'clock news. I mean, it wouldn't make sense. So I was born and raised in a Christian home where Jesus' love was lived and shown. And I've not, I don't remember a time in my life when I didn't profess Christ as Lord. So I don't know when I was saved. As far as the apologetic goes, because I was born and raised in a Christian home, I loved sharing my faith with people. I loved apologetics. I love a defense of the Christian faith. 
And it wasn't uh, until it was uh, 2006, I, I think it was 2004, I posted my website in 2006, but in 2004, I realized that the way I was defending my faith was not a biblical way. I wasn't even talking about the God that I believed in. We can get into that a little bit later on. But um, I started building a website based on all the common arguments for the existence of God, the cosmological, theological, ontological. And I, one of the things I think I'm, I'm gifted in, because I'm a factory worker, I spent most of my life working in a boiler room. I think one of the things I'm gifted with is taking difficult concepts and dumbing them down to my level. And that's what I did with all of these arguments for the existence of God. And I would share them with my Christian friends, and they loved it. They said, Sai, you have to get these out there. So I started building this website with all of these great Christian arguments dumbed down to my level, and the Christians loved it. And then I would go to my work, and I would share these arguments with unbelievers, and I'd get them shoved down my throat. And I didn't know why. And I found out later that the reason why a lot of the, uh, the times that happens is because they're terrible arguments. But why do Christians love these arguments? Christians love these arguments because the conclusion is true. God exists. But a lot of them commit horrible logical fallacies. And I didn't know that. And that's actually ended up that I was representing a God that I didn't believe in. I was representing a probability because all of these arguments argue for a probable God. And so I shelved the project for the website for about two years. But I still like listening to debates. And by the grace of God, I was introduced to a debate called the Great Debate uh, and it was Greg Bonson, a Christian versus Dr. Gordon Stein. And it was like nothing I'd ever heard before. And then I found out that that was called presuppositional apologetics. So then I changed the nature of my site from being what I knew before, the evidential type arguments, to a presuppositional argument. I posted my website in 2006. And then I started uh, going online and uh, engaging unbelievers on their websites. Because I would post my website, and then unbelievers would make fun of my website on their atheist page. And whenever anybody posted a link to my website... I got a notification. So I'd sign up in these forums and they'd say, if that idiot ever showed up here, you know, I'd, I'd tell him this. And, and I would show up into these forums. A lot of times they'd be very respectful and we'd have conversations and I would debate back and forth thousands and thousands of posts. And I think that's when I really honed my skill at, um, at defending the faith. And I actually, uh, it's interesting you, sh you asked this because I don't, I haven't shared this. I don't think on, um, on very many shows, if any, but so I started arguing in these different forums, in these different um, atheistic forums. And this Christian saw me doing that. And he said, Sai, this is really cool. He says, I'm having trouble with some atheists in this other forum. He said, will you come over here and uh, help me out? So I went into that forum and I debated these atheists and he loved it. And he said, Sai, I'm going to be on this British uh, radio show in a couple of weeks. I want you to listen to it. So it was actually the, unbelie uh, the, the unbelievable show with Justin Brierley. It's called Unbelievable. And uh, he was a guest on that show, and I listened to it, and I thought it was terrible. I thought, this, this is not good. So I contacted the host of the show, Justin Brierley. I said, you need to get a presuppositionist on this show. And he says, do you have anybody in mind? I said, I don't know if there are any in England, you know, and I looked around. And then I finally said, okay, I'll do it. And he got a woman to debate me, and this woman soon afterwards backed out of the debate. I don't know what the reasoning was, but then they got another fellow to debate me. The guy's name was Paul Baird. And in 2010, I had my first debate that had any kind of traction and it was the number nine of the top 10 downloads of that radio show for about a year and it went way better than I could ever have imagined and, and I didn't know why but a, a number of months after that my pastor's wife shared with me something that was really cool he said that her father who's a retired Presbyterian pastor he got up when I because the show was uh, recorded in England and the six hour time difference from where I was and it was like six in the morning. And I heard that her father got up at six o'clock in the morning and he was praying the whole time that I was on the air. And I thought, well, that's why it went so well. But from there, things blew up and um, I started to get into more debates. And then in 2013, we came up with the film, How to Answer the Fool. And then things kind of got um, spread out from there. And um, so that's what I do. I teach people how to defend their faith and what I now believe is the biblical method of defending the faith. Yeah, I, I you know I I was blessed to watch How to Answer the Fool. Uh, I've watched all the scenes there, one of the controversial scenes there, and the, when you're answering people outside, it's, it's 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 encouraging to see and it's inspiring to see people like you, uh, in passion is sharing the gospel to the people, you know, not just only defending the faith by answering their questions or objections, but it's more of you really you're really passionate and and very uh. uh gracious in sharing the gospel to these people because you love them and and that's 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 the christian way that's 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 our faith and and that's how we show our love to people by showing their fallacies and to show them the true faith which is in jesus and 
I've seen the scene with with you with Eric uh with with, with the debate with Villahanti. I think it's in online. But then again, it's a bit of controversial. But but yeah, but all the scenes there in How to Answer the Fool. If you want to watch that, I think it's on YouTube. You can listen right. to watch that. And you can also look into sites, website, which is uh 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 prove that God prove that God exists dot org. Yeah. And you can support Sign Periscope. I think you have Periscope or you have the, Patreon. Uh, Patreon. Patreon. Patreon.com slash Sci 10 B. But um yeah, and, and I know that you know you compliment me and stuff like this, but the beautiful thing about this apologetic is anybody can do it. Jesus said, I will give you words and wisdom that your adversaries will not be able to resist or contradict. And what you'll discover when you watch more and more of what I do is that I don't teach people how to defend their faith. I teach them how not to. Because we're supposed to be able to defend our faith. Jesus said, I will give you words and wisdom that your adversaries will not be able to resist or contradict. And then I say, but I know why people invite me to conferences. Because in John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear sighs really good argument. He doesn't say that. He said, my sheep hear my voice. Or I say in Romans 1, 16, it says, you know, the power of God into salvation is sighs really good argument. No, it's the gospel. And the problem is that we think that we have to go to the library to learn all these evidences to try and defeat the argument when it's the gospel that's the power of God and salvation. I think a lot of people are put on this earth just to waste our time. And I think a lot of Christians are duped into wasting their time in something that's not essential. And there's, there's an analogy that I came up with. I say, let's say you're about to talk to an unbeliever. And you can have anybody in history standing beside you other than Jesus. You had a time machine. I say, would you want like me or would you like want an expert in, Muslim, in, in, uh, in Islam or in Mormonism? Or how about the Apostle Peter? And I say, if you picked anybody other than the Apostle Peter, I, I mean, one of us, I can't help you. And I say, now imagine all the conversation that all these different people have with these atheists or Muslims or, or Mormons. And imagine the conversation that the Apostle Peter had with them. And think to yourself, which of those could I do? And I'm sure most Christians would say, well, I could do what the Apostle Peter did. I mean... He'll just say, I walk with Jesus. You want to know how to be made right with him. And I think any Christian could do that, but the world has duped us into believing that we have to know all these evidences and arguments in order to defend our faith. But, and I say, if you think that you have to be smarter to defend your faith, then you're probably doing it wrong. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I think it, it also applies today that uh, many, many believers are getting into books that somehow would somehow help them how to defend the faith. But we have the Bible, we have the gospel that, Changed it, that shaped us into the likeness of Jesus and to be like Jesus, and it's a wonderful thing that to see uh, people like you, uh, well, uh, even as a leading us and as, and as an example to every one of us that we have the Bible, we, we have the gospel. Why do we go to preach the gospel itself? Because Peter did that, and Paul did that. So they don't have any like books that they any source that they have today, but they have the gospel that saved them through Jesus Christ. Right. And for those of you who your viewers who are not familiar with the different uh, schools of apologetic, the best way that I found to describe it is imagine that you put a fossil on a desk and you had an unbelieving geologist, a PhD, look at that fossil. And you had a Christian geologist look at that fossil and examine that evidence. Now, the Christian would look at that fossil and he might say uh, Noah's flood thousands of years. And the unbelieving PhD would look at that fossil and say millions of years. The exact same evidence, but they have different conclusions. Why do they have different conclusions? Not because of the evidence, but because of the beliefs they take to the evidence. And those beliefs that we take to evidence are our foundational beliefs. They're called our presuppositions. And what I expose is that unless you have Christian presuppositions, you can't make sense of examining evidence. And in the high 90 percentile of Christian apologetics is teaching people how to examine evidence. When I say it's a fruitless endeavor, because we will all examine evidence according to what we already believe. So rather than do that, I show that the Christian presuppositions is what you need to make sense of evidence. And the analogy that I use, I say, if somebody comes up to you and says, I don't believe in God, and you give them evidence, where do you hear evidence most often out in the world? Now, you hear it in different fields, but I say most often you hear the term evidence in the court of law. Now, who in court do you give evidence to? You give it to the judge and jury. So if an unbeliever comes up to you and says, I don't believe in God, and you give them evidence, who are you saying is the judge and jury? Them. And in what seat in that courtroom do we put the Lord of glory, the King of kings? We put him in the criminal's box, and we elevate the unbeliever to the position of judge. Now, God has given us wonderful evidences. We can win that court case. But then who's the judge? The unbeliever can say, you have satisfied my demand for evidence. Now I'm going to bow and worship your king? It doesn't make any sense. The Bible says everyone knows that God exists, and he is judge. So rather than give them evidence and elevate them to the position of judge, I expose the fact that they already know 
that he is judged. Romans chapter 1 says, everyone has sufficient knowledge of God for their condemnation. They're without excuse. And so this is a biblical apologetic. And what I tell people is that if I'm done debating or doing a street encounter or anything like that, I don't think to myself, I need to study philosophy more. I need to study logic more. My primary thought is I need to read my Bible more because that is what God uses to save people. And that is, you know, and you'd be surprised when you're out in the street and you quote a scripture verse to somebody rather than, than some convoluted argument. And that's the type of thing that you hope that God is going to use to save them. Uh, if you want to know, sign the Philippines, um, they, are, they are street evangelists, but most of mm-hmm. them are cults that uh, are right. possible, but they're mystics. So uh, I think it, it will be a challenge also for us. Uh, maybe, maybe you have an experience um, sharing to our Mormon uh, maybe you're sharing to someone, but uh, in the Philippines, there are many cults. Like, you can just, man, there are countless. We have a famous one that who claims to be Christ in, in a certain province. So, uh, we, right. we're not also uh, defending ourselves to the unbelievers, but also to these people that who claim that they are Christians. And, and, right. And I think that, that most Christian apologists miss the mark when they deal with the cults. Because yeah. the Bible doesn't only say that atheists know the God. It says that the Mormon knows the God, the Muslim knows he's got the God, the Jehovah's Witness knows the, the God. And rather than confront them with that, we try and prove that their God is fake or that their God doesn't exist. And I say, but the Bible says that they are without excuse for this sin against the God they know exists. So if you're about to talk to a group of Jehovah's Witness, and just before you get there, they get hit by a bus. Does any Christian think that they're going any place other than hell? No, we believe that they're going to hell. Why? Because there's sin against the God that they know exists. So I think that what we need to do is confront them that the fact, with the fact that they already know that God exists. So what I do with the cults is I might go up to them and I say, look, you have come and knocked on my door, or you're doing this ministry out on the street. You, know, you must be really concerned for my soul. Could you do me a favor? Could you tell me what I need to do to be saved? Could you share the gospel with me? And of course, they never have the biblical gospel because they're a cult. And so then you take him to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 to 7, and you show what the Apostle Paul said was the gospel. And you say, what you showed me was not the gospel. And you take him to Galatians 1, verse 8, and it says, even if an angel came down and shared something other than the true gospel, they're anathema, they're cursed. So then I would say to that Mormon or Jehovah's Witness, you have come to my door, or you have done this ministry, and you're out sharing a false gospel. And the Bible says that you're anathema, you're cursed, you need to repent. And anybody could do that. Because I don't think that the Apostle Peter would be running to the library to get the King Follett discourse or to get all the hadiths before they go and talk to that group. He would go to them and say, do you want to know how to be made right with Jesus Christ? And I think any Christian can do that. And like I said, if you do it biblically and properly, it's easy to defend your faith. And I don't only say that because that's what the Bible says. That is sufficient. But people can go to my channel. They can go and look at my debates. And I'm not an intelligent guy. You know, I'm a factory worker and I've debated PhDs in, ph- in philosophy but I'm able to do it not because I'm smart, but because I argue from the truth of Scripture. And you'll see that, that, that Scripture calls the unbeliever a fool. And when you argue biblically, it's very easy to expose their folly. Now, does that mean that God is going to save them? Well, we hope that he will. But, but that's not our goal. Our goal, uh, the goal of apologetics is not to save people because we can't save people. The goal of apologetics is to close mouths in the hope that the Holy Spirit penetrates into that silence and, and saves them, grants them a heart of flesh, takes out their heart of stone, and that's the goal of apologetics, because we can't save even one person. And sadly, most views of apologetics are trying to give the person evidence and arguments so that they repent. When 2 Timothy 2.24 says, in the hope that God grants them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Most apologetics are trying to give the person the truth so that they repent. And the Bible says they must repent before they can understand the truth. So we give them truth, not so that, re- that they repent. We give them truth so that in, in the hopes that the Holy Spirit grants them a heart of flesh, grants them repentance so they can understand the truth that we give them. Amen. Amen. Uh, hearing those words, uh, I, I'm, I'm now really getting into the, the hype of it. And it was really <laughs> Thank you, Sai, for giving that wonderful uh, part and the message and also for commenting. Um, Sai, um, I want to, before we get into the main questions, um, I do want to ask the Fight Peace Conference because I, I think you know this. Uh, I think Jeff said something. <laughs> It just became a controversial. What, what was that? Uh, can you give us a short background? What's what happened to the fight? Sorry, um, I'm you're cutting out a little bit. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, the fight feast conference, uh, oh, the fight last feast conference, yeah. So, can you give us a background of what it is, what happens there, and uh, what Jeff said? <laughs> 
Um, I, I was actually at the conference, um, but I was hanging out on the tables most of the time. I did hear the sermon, and um, yeah, I did hear what he said, but I haven't commented on it publicly. I haven't done it on my Facebook page, and I don't plan on doing it here. Yeah, no <laughs> because the thing is, what, what I find is that, you know, he delivered a message, and where I stand on that message, you know, I, you know, I, I think it's irrelevant to what the message had said. Um, yeah, I, do, I would just prefer not to comment on it because I don't, I don't want to... Uh, my position is irrelevant. I think that there are people who are far more uh, um, knowledgeable about that. I think it's more of a pastoral question. I'm an apologist. I'm not a pastor. So I think that that question is more uh, pastoral. Jeff is a dear, dear brother of mine, and I know his heart. So even for those who disagree with what he did, it was not a show. You know, I just want to encourage people that it was not a show. I know his heart. He's got a wonderful, loving Christian heart. And I'm sure he thought a lot about it. And I'm just not going to comment on where I stand on it. But I want the people to know that it was not for attention. It was not a show. That it was sincere. And I just won't comment on whether or not I would have done it. I'll let you figure that out on your own. So. I just heard from Facebook and saw the news and everything. And I just want to hear from the people who were in that conference. And I never asked Joe Wilson the, case, the question yet. But I'm going to ask him maybe privately. But yeah, um, I, it was it was a very hard hitting sermon, and um, you know, like I say, I I don't even listen to the messages when I go to a conference. I was at one of the side tables, but I my ears did perk up when he was speaking like that. And if people want to check it out for themselves, they can. But uh, I would just prefer, you know, and I'm not really the one to take the easy way out, but I am going to this time. So <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sai. Um, so Sai, um, before we get into the other uh, main the main question, uh, since I think you're passionate also about abortion issue uh i think you've evangelizing people in the hospitals and and also people that want to get their child aborted and i want to raise these concerns because in the philippines we have a rise of abortion rates like uh, there's just one facebook page in the philippines that's been spread out that there's an uh, online abortion clinic that you can like provide services and you can just abort your child and pay their services so it's like can you help us uh can you also uh encourage the believers and also maybe talk to the unbelievers that who are pro abortionists they're in the abortion rates or in the abortion issue and uh what can you say or what do you usually say to these people that who wanted to do abortion and to also uh not abort and find their find the gospel in jesus christ right um well for people who watch my videos when i'm ever at an abortion clinic one thing you'll see is that i never argue the science and uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with the work that I do, I did a, um, a show. I started doing this series, and actually I've only done one of them so far, but it's uh, Answer Anyone. And my first video on that was uh, answering a fellow named Matt Walsh. And Matt Walsh, he worked for Ben Shapiro, and he was being interviewed by Ben Shapiro. And one thing he said was, uh, you know, it was quite shocking. He said that in matters of abortion or in gender identity, we do not cite the Bible because people don't believe the Bible. My friend John Speed said, Sai, you got to do something about this. So I wrote an article on um, the blog that I write for sometimes, Gospel Spam. And I exposed the folly of saying, do not cite to the Bible when it comes to these issues. And Matt Walsh, for some reason, decided to talk about that article on his show for about 20 minutes. And he was rid ridiculing my position. And so I put together an hour-long video. It's how to answer Matt Walsh. It's on my Answer Anyone channel. And I showed the folly of the position of not citing to Scripture. So you'll see that when I'm at the clinics, I never argue the science. And one of the things that Matt Walsh said, that we have to convince the woman that what's inside them is not a clump of cells. And that's what he teaches over and over again. And uh, just before I came to Pensacola, I spent a day with my dear brother, John Barrows. And for those of you who are not familiar with his ministry, please Google him. John Barrows, B-A-R-R-O-S. And he's uh, been in the abortion ministry for about 20 years, but there's a particular clinic that he sits outside of in Orlando, Orlando Women's Center, and I spent the day with him there yesterday. But he's been there almost every day that it's been open for about 10 years. And our, with those 10 years in accumulation, he's credited with saving about 3,000 babies. I mean, the way the Lord has blessed that ministry. Now, he gives all credit to God. But you'll see in that interview, I asked him, I said, in all of those thousands of women that you've seen go to that clinic to abort their child, how many have argued with you that they're just trying to get rid of a clump of cells? And he said, none of them. He said, they get, I can kill my bleeping baby if I bleeping want to. So he says that these people who say that they're arguing just for a clump of cells, he says, who are they? He said, they need to get out from behind their desks. And the people have, 
the people who say that it's only a clump of cells are women who are not pregnant. Huh. Women who are pregnant know that they have an image bearer of God within them. So I never argue the science. I preach the gospel to them in the hope that not only lives are saved, but that souls are saved as well. Because if you argue the science and you happen to save, you know, by the grace of God, somebody is saved from killing their baby. And if they're not saved themselves, you're just prolonging the inevitable. They're still going to hell, but they're going to hell a little bit later. So the reason that we go to these abortion bills, it's not about the numbers. I preached at a, a sermon at a, an abortion conference recently. It's not about the numbers. It's about glorifying God. And the way that we glorify God at those clinics is to preach the gospel in the hope that not only lives are saved, but that souls are saved. Because when a soul is saved, you're responsible for generations upon generations of people that will you know, happen from the person that was saved. So that's why it's, it's a vital important to preach the gospel. It's not about the numbers. It's about glorifying God when you go to those clinics. And, and as far as the people who are watching who are contemplating this, I do not try and convince them that it's not a clump of cells because they know. They know what they're doing. They're not victims. They know exactly what they're doing. And we need to go out there and love these people because it's easy to point your finger at them. But what I do when I'm at the clinic, I say to these people, if not for the grace of God, I'm standing with you. You know, they have the death scorch that they bring these people past the, you know, the Christians who are out there. I say, except for the grace of God, I'm you. Even the person killing their child, I say, except for the grace of God, I'm you. So we love them. And we recognize that if it wasn't for God's grace, we would be them. We love them and we tell them the only way out of their situation. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, it's encouraging to see and hear that your passion also in sharing the gospel to the people who are attending abortion clinics. And also it's became an issue in the Philippines because, you know, uh, in the Philippines, uh, cyber sex has been a, 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 a thing and prostitutions and, and, and um, human child trafficking has been in the Philippines ever since. And um, we need to share the gospel to these people and even to the even to those people who are somehow victims of the child of human trafficking and also other uh, segments that are leading to abortions because uh, they, they, they didn't know what's going on and they don't know that they're sinners and we need to share the gospel to them. So thank you so well, much. I would say I would say they know that they're sinners, but they don't know the way out of their sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's why we share the gospel with them. And, you know, I might explain why they're sinners, what sin is, but you got to keep in mind, too, and as, as you're familiar with, I don't know what it's like in the Philippines, but sometimes you have 15 seconds when they jump out of the car and then they go into the doors. And, you know, you don't have a lot of time to share with them, but, you know, you share that we love them and that there's hope for them and there's hope for their child. And because and, I asked John in that interview, I said, of the people that have been saved or the babies have been saved in that clinic, I said, how many are a result of gospel preaching? And he said, all of them. And then he corrected himself. He says, there are some people who just see him standing out there and they, they stop and they don't go in because they needed just that thing to prevent them. He says, so there's a small percentage that are, that are uh, saved even without him opening his mouth. He said, but they, all the other ones are saved because of hearing the gospel. He's had women at that clinic run out of the clinic, fall on their knees on the grass and say, what do I need to do to be saved? And it's by the preaching of the gospel. So when you hear people say, just argue the science, argue the evidence, it's nonsense. It, it doesn't save. Now, you might have a, a save, you know, when you compare somebody to Hitler, but inevitably, or in the long run, what do you get from that? Nothing. They're still going to hell. So it's important. You know, I go there because it's a, it's a, it's a rich environment of unbelief and of wickedness. So we go there to, to preach the gospel in the hope that I say, like, God, that he saves lives, but most importantly, that he saves souls. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sai, for giving us and sharing to us in that. And to the listeners, if you're Watching, you can share this video to share to your friends, to your family, loved ones, church members, and even to your unbelieving friends. Maybe that they will find this a blessing, a branch of blessing that to also hear about the gospel in our conversation with Sai. And also like us on Facebook and help us to reach our thousand likes on, in our Facebook page. We're almost in a thousand. And it's a blessing that uh, we can share these resources with you. And of course, our episode tonight with Sai. Sai, um, let's proceed to the main questions uh, that I sent you. I believe that all oh, this is also the questions of the people who, who um, sent in. And I'm going to ask you... Uh, Did you send me questions? I didn't get any questions. So this will be raw answers because I didn't oh. receive any questions. Or if, if you sent them, I never saw them. So. <laughs> yeah, I think I said it. Go wing it. Go wing it. That's better this way. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you can also answer this. Uh, I'm going to put it also in like a, a two-question part, like, uh, what made you inspired to 
uh, start how to answer the fool. And the main first question is, according to Scripture, who is the fool? Well, I would say, according to Scripture, the fool is the person who professes unbelief. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And, and Scripture throughout calls the person the fool as the person who rejects you know, what they know to be true. And one thing is, um, a fool, they're not necessarily dumb people. A lot of people that I engage are a lot smarter than I am, but a fool is a moral charge of willful suppression of the truth. And I say, who in Scripture did Jesus call the fool? He called the fool the man who built his house on the sand. Now, did that man know that what he was doing was foolish? I'm sure that he did. That's the fool, the fool who does, somebody, does something and knows better. So the fool in Scripture is somebody who knows that God exists, and it says in Romans chapter 1, suppresses the truth and unrighteousness because they love their sin. Yeah, it's a simple and sweet answer from Sai. Uh, according to Scripture, what is the fool? And, and we, can, we can search out on the Bible and the verses what Jesus said, and everything is there about the fool. And I believe, aside, we can also like have Proverbs. The book of Proverbs has many things about the fool, uh, what he does. You're not actually the fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. Yeah. And I say, what is the fool's folly? The fool says there is no God. Do not answer him according to his folly. Do not pretend there's no God and try and argue to God. But then what's the very next verse? Answer the fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So what do we do then? Now do we say, well, let's pretend there's no God? No, we say, you say there's no God. How do you make sense of this? How do you make sense of that? And then you expose the folly of unbelief. Man, amen. So I'm going to uh, have a, like a, a, a continuing question uh, I forgot to ask a while ago. Is that what made you inspired to start How to Answer the Fool? What, what, what would be, what's the uh, motivation of that? Well, interestingly enough, again, it's a good question because I don't share this story very often, but I was actually visiting Eric's ministry here, and I was driving back to Canada. And um, my friend Marcus Pittman was in, uh, in Atlanta at the time, actually just north of Atlanta. And he was living in, uh, with, in David Shannon's house, the Chocolate Knox. And they called me as I was approaching uh, Georgia, and they said, Sai, we, we really want to interview you. And I was tired from driving like I am now, and I really didn't want to do it. But they said, come on, Sai, it will be edifying. So I said, all right. So they dragged this leather couch onto David's driveway, and they set up these makeshift lights, and they interviewed me. And the, they ended up calling the show Edified. And you can find that on Marcus's uh, YouTube channel, Crown Rights. And we had such a good time. And David, at the time, he was working for uh, Gary DeMar from American Vision. And um, I had lunch with him, I believe it was the next day or so, and um, explaining the apologetic, the amount of fun that we had, you know, doing this Edified show. And they said, we got to do something about this. And, and at that time, the, the, the plan was uh, to do this film. And so American Vision, you know, supported the film. David was working for them at the time. But it was just that really that edified thing that we did together. And David interviewed a few more people on that driveway. He interviewed uh, Gary DeMar and Ray Rhodes. And I really, that's another show that they, I hope they uh, fire up again. Marcus is moving to Moscow, Idaho, up to be up there with David. So it'd be a wonderful opportunity to sh start that show again. But that's what birthed How to Answer the Fool is uh, the three of us together in uh, Georgia. Oh, that's interesting. So that's how it started, Paul. And it was supposed to actually be mostly me teaching. But I was speaking at a conference in New Jersey, and um, Gary DeMar um, said to David and Marcus and, and Ivy Connerly from California, he was, doing, he was a sound man, he's a rapper, he also did the song for the film. But he paid for all of them to go to this conference in New Jersey to film me while I was on the street. And I was nervous. I'd never had a film crew with me before. And I did not like the idea because, you know, I'm just normally doing this by myself. But he sent this film crew uh, to film me on the streets. And at the end of the day, David said, this film is going to be different. He said, it's not going to be mostly you teaching. It's going to be street evangelism. And that's mostly how the film turned out, just because of the wonderful day that we had together in New Jersey that day. And we actually filmed it about over just a few days, you know, at different locations of me engaging people on the street, combined with uh, some preaching and teaching moments. Uh, I... I, I... I, I don't know what's the feeling like you're you're gonna share the gospel, but at the same time there there's cameras up on you. <laughs> like, <gasps> well, it's interesting. You notice that Darren Doan was one of the executive producers, and he does a lot of Kirk Cameron's films. He did the Collision film, and um, David went to California and he helped edit it. Darren helped edit it as well. But one thing he remarked, just like you say, is how natural I looked on camera, and the reason was because David and Marcus were the cameramen and they were my friends. So I felt right at home. I think if it was strange people, then it would have been totally different. But because it was my friends filming me, it just uh, felt like a, you know, a bunch of guys getting together. There's a lot of outtakes that I've published later. 
But at one point, um, I don't know if it's in the film or not, but I said to the fellow that uh, who was just giving a foolish answer, I said, you're making the cameraman laugh. And my friend David and Marcus, they, they were chuckling at, at the folly of uh, the I thought, answer. I think I saw that scene. I think I saw okay. the camera then, and then this guy. Is just... <laughs> yeah, and that was David and Marcus. And that's why, you know, it, it felt natural because of dear friends of mine, one's holding the camera. So I didn't even pay attention to the fact that there were cameras there. <laughs> yeah. I had experience. Eric just brought me a water. Eric Hoven oh. brought me a water. That's so cool. Wow. Wow. Such, such a servant heart of Eric giving you water. Yeah. He's a good guy. I probably <laughs> owe him now. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, another glass of water. It's part of the rental studio fee. <laughs> he said it's part of the studio rental fee. Oh, that's why. <laughs> I'll forward the bill to you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sai, for giving us the wonderful background of documentary uh, it's a blessing I'm jealous i shouldn't be jealous or envious but i'm gonna have to fix my studio after being here i mean this is really cool yeah yeah or maybe you can stay in the near eric, eric so that you can also rent yeah that'd be nice yeah you can be neighbors i don't know if i could sleep somewhere back here though <laughs> <laughs> yeah eric's gonna eric's gonna do that for you I don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you Sai, for answering the question uh about the documentary and also the first question and I, I saw the video and I was really invested in watching. I was really focused. I, I, I praise God, brother. I was focused on that. And, and I've seen really the, the situation there in the U.S. I was imagining that my I was watching. What if Sai would be in the Philippines and also share the gospel here in Manila? <laughs> yeah, you're going to have like sorts of people <laughs> you can converse with. Well, I don't know if you're, if you're aware, but I was invited to speak uh, in, in uh, the Philippines in August. But because of COVID, that was canceled. So I'm supposed to come next year now. So hopefully, I'll be able to see all of you when I when I come down yeah, there. Let's, let's have like we're going to see. I'm excited. I'm very thrilled to see you. And interestingly enough, my father was born and raised in Indonesia, so he's from your neck of the woods. But um, it was on a Dutch colony in Indonesia. He, his parents were born in Holland, but he was born in Indonesia. So I do have some um, background from your your area of the world. So. Yeah, yeah. But it's gonna be great if you're being in the Philippines to see not. Only the beautiful things, but also the uh, the bad things, the other side of things that we're gonna see. Yeah, many things are happening. The first thing. But anyway, I said about that, about that. Yeah. Uh, the second question, aside, we're gonna ask is, uh, since you are in the documentary, I've I've I've, I've watched the out answer the full and also your debates. But what are some of the common questions or arguments that atheists usually throw at? What are what are the whether the usual or the common that people would argue and you say something and then you would counter argue all these things what are the some of the questions and arguments and how do you answer them yeah well i mean one of the questions they might say because as a presupposition as i appeal to my presupposition is the bible and they would ask me well how do you know the bible is true and um so as a presupposition i always have to look at what they're standing on when they ask a question like that now, I'll answer that question different for a Christian, because how we know the Bible is, is true is by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. The testimony of the Holy Spirit, he reveals to us such that we know for certain that the Bible is true. But the unbeliever, they don't stand on that foundation. But when they say, how do I know the Bible is true, what do they assume? They assume that there's a concept of truth. Otherwise, they couldn't make sense of their question. How do you know the Bible is true? So I might say to an unbeliever, if it wasn't, you couldn't make sense of your question. Say, what are you talking about? I say, well, you're asking me, how do, I know, how do I know the Bible's true? I say, so you assume that there's a standard of truth, but you believe that you're evolved pond scum. You believe that your brain is an evolved meat computer, a very complex one, mind you, but it's a computer made of meat. And you believe that your thoughts are the off-gassing of the electrical chemical processes in your brain. And Doug Wilson came up with the experiment of shaking a bottle of Mountain Dew and a bottle of Doc Dr. Pepper. You shake them up and you open them up and you watch them fizz. And you say, which of those fizzes would be true? You say, none of them. It's just fizz. It's just a chemical reaction. Well, if evolution is true, then what we think are not true thoughts. It's just brain barf. I say, so as an evolutionist, as a non-Christian, you have no concept of truth in order to examine my Bible. So how do I know the Bible is true? Because if it wasn't, you couldn't make sense of your question. And of course, you know that you might have to explain that to the unbeliever. But a lot of times it gets far more philosophical than you need to be. So I might even say to an un unbeliever, how do I know the Bible is true? God reveals the truth of it to me. And you need to read it until he does it to you or until he casts you into hell. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I've seen that other people somehow would answer to that, uh, like what you said. But they would just laugh 
And you say, what? Just look at the book, the Bible, and all that stuff. Have you ever that kind of uh, experience of people like somehow did that to you or talked to you about it? And did you respond to that? Yeah, we get all sorts of responses. But the thing is, and this is a reformed apologetic, that the only thing that we contribute to our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. So as reformed believers, we understand that there's two types of people when it comes to their eternal destiny on this earth. The Bible describes them as sheep, those who will end up in heaven, and goats, those who will end up in hell. But one thing that Scripture never says is that goats become sheep. Jesus Christ said, my sheep hear my voice. Now, we don't know who the goats and sheep are, so we treat everyone like a sheep. We give them sheep food, and sheep food is the gospel. Now, if you have a goat come along, and you give them a gospel message, and they make fun of you, and they laugh, and they walk away, it doesn't matter. If they're a sheep, they will hear his voice. And if they're a goat, they can't hear his voice. So our responsibility is not the fruit. Our responsibility is faithfulness. And our, our faithfulness is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if they laugh and if they mock, it doesn't matter. Jesus' sheep will hear his voice, and we can be confident of that. Yeah, and, and they're not mocking us. They're mocking God himself if they would come to our business. Because I have many friends that who are passionate in evangelism, and they get discouraged because... Uh, they, they laughed at me or they said something wrong. It wasn't the thing that I expected to be. And now they're disappointed and now they're somehow not doing it anymore. And I believe well, a lot of times these people are not reformed because we have to understand what does Scripture say happens to the goats who receive the words of Jesus Christ and reject them? The Bible says they're being fattened for the slaughter. So we go to a group of people. We don't know if they're sheep or goats. They might all be goats. And we, we're going there, we say, God, you, please use us to save these people. And God might be saying, no, you're going there to fatten those people for the slaughter. Now, do I want to be used that way? I'd much rather be used to save people. That's not up to me. It's up to me to be faithful. And if God, you know, uses that, you know, for, to mock people, fattening for the slaughter, it's not up to me. But we have to keep in mind that they should not be offended at us. They should be offended at the message. Yeah, so it's a great point that uh, we, we want to point out to the listeners that never stop claiming the Gospels because if we hold on the truth and we hold on to things that we believe in, why not share it to them? Why not defend the faith? Why not, why not uh, present to them the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the thing that, that saved us? It's not, it's not only that. It's just those mockers, there might be a sheep among them. And I remember hearing a story of this guy who's a famous BMX cyclist. It wasn't my friend Eddie Roman, but it was another story. And I have to look for that online to see if I can find it. But God saved him over a 20-year period. It took 20 years for, for that person to become a Christian. And at the end of his testimony, he said, but what I didn't share with you is 20 years ago, I heard a man preaching in the open air, and it never left me. Now, he might have been one of those mockers 20 years before, but it never left him. And that's one thing that people need to be encouraged with. Even if they mock, even if they laugh, you did not miss God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword, and you hope that God will use it to save them. And if he's one of their sheep, he will use it to save them. And if he's not a sheep, there's nothing you can do about it. Thank you, Sai, for answering the question. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's encouraging to see, uh, and it's encouraging to hear from you, from these words from you. And I believe that you've sourced it out from the word of God. And it's the only thing, that we can share the gospel to them. And also to answer them, it comes from the word of God. Because I would, I would uh, say that sometimes you know, we, we, we try to have certain strategies or techniques that would mm -hmm. uh, the, the, about pastors or even they would look up the debates and then would somehow write them in their notes and then would somehow. Uh, it's it's kind of, it's kind of, I think it's for me, it's like an effort thing. Like, like you're, you're putting something to waste rather than right. we, we study his word that God revealed himself and then God would reveal to these people as we share them. And I believe that uh, we need, in the Philippines, we need to emphasize on that kind of evangelism. That kind of yeah, and I encourage people too, when they listen to what I say, people might disagree with it. And I say, I don't want you to listen to what I say with an open mind. I want you to listen with an open book. Yes. Check everything that I say according to Scripture and see if what I say is not consistent with Scripture. And I think that you'll find is that most of the apologetic methodology that you learn those are the ones that are not consistent with Scripture, because Scripture never tries to prove that God exists. It says, in the beginning, God. And that's the God we need to represent when we go out in the street. Yeah, in Genesis, in the beginning, God, it's a presupposition that the beginning, God. 
Yeah, it's not in the beginning an argument for God, or in the beginning something, not let me try and prove that God exists, it's in the beginning God. And that's how we need to, to share our faith. Yeah, that's a strong statement, uh, Genesis. In the beginning, God. Really a strong statement. Yeah, God. Uh, he's there. <laughs> that, that He's powerful and He's sovereign. He's... Well, like I say, when a person becomes a Christian, they don't go from unbelief to, the, to belief. They go from suppressing the truth to professing it. Nobody becomes a Christian and says, well, what do you know? There is a God. They say, I've known that He exists all along, but I've been suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And even if somebody came up to me and said, I didn't know that he exists, I wouldn't believe him. I believe what the Bible says. Amen. Amen to that. Right. Thank you for answering the question. But Sai, before we get into the other questions, uh, we're going to go to our commercial break and check out these videos that you can check out on. Uh, you can uh, support them and also watch the following series. Hey everyone, this is the commercial break and we want to promote some of the ministry partners that we have and also other podcasts, ministries, online ministries, uh, online stores that are faithful in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at the same time, uh, we want to help them out also by promoting them on our episode tonight. So the first will be the Christian Worldview Project. It exists for the glory of God in the name of Christ alone. And it is from Jordan Ravanis. I had them on the show. Uh, the second episode, I believe, of the podcast. You can like them on Facebook and subscribe on YouTube. But the coming October 30, which uh, uh, yours truly will be the moderator, uh, it will be on October 30, 6 p.m. We'll be having a wonderful debate between Gillian Red Bautista and Mark Stephen Pandan, which is the topic about is the Roman Catholic doctrine of Mary true. It will be on October 30. It's 6 p.m. in Manila. It will be Jillian and Mark Steven Pandan. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be a great debate. Uh, you should watch this 6 p.m. Mark your calendar on that day. And of course, we have Easy Theology with Ed and Eddie, which is one of our contributors and co-hosts of the podcast, Gerard Pelaez and Pastor Ed. Uh, Ed Carl Cortez. Uh, they're from the Christ the Victorious King Church and they have their ministry, which is Easy Theology with Ed and Eddie. You can subscribe to their YouTube channel. Uh, they would also on Facebook that they would update their episodes and they have the Reformation series episode on Facebook. And you, they also have the archives that they also ask questions from people. Check them out on YouTube, on Facebook, and they have many things in store for all of you. And of course, Schooled by Christ. You can subscribe to their YouTube channel. They have weekly videos. This is headed by Pastor Joseph Mangahas of the Cubao Reformed Baptist Church. And uh, it's, good. it's a great ministry. You can check their videos. You can also like them on Facebook for more updates of School by Christ. Now we go on to the, um, some ministries that um, are doing retail uh, for us not only to be informed in the faith but also to wear them confidently and one of them is Theology Matters headed by Pastor James Tombok and he's a designer and he's designing now shirts all for the Reformation as you can see here is a, one of the samples of these shirts it's only at 350 pesos and you can order your shirts at bit.ly slash theomatters shirts that's bit.ly slash theomatters shirts you can like them on Facebook and to inquire for more details Go to their Facebook page. They have all sorts of designs for 350 pesos with regards to Reformation, the Valley of Vision, and many, many more. And of course, we have the Puritan Project Philippines. They're their distributor of affordable and Puritan and Reformed literature. They have their uh, operations here, as you can see. It's in Monday to Friday, 8 to 5 p.m. in all their deliveries, all their in uh, inquiries. You can subscribe to their Facebook page and ask for more. And this is a wonderful uh, uh, online book ministry. They are selling uh, Puritan Reformed Christian books. So if you have uh, time and also the budget, you can uh, go down to their Facebook page and um, check their channel. Check their also their books they're about to um, uh, they're selling. Currently, I bought the Reformed Preaching by Dr. Joel Behe. It's a great book, great texture and great service provided by the Puritan Project Philippines. And next is Coram Deo Books. These are the books of Coram Deo. They are new, but at the same time, they are really, really awesome. They sell also Reformed books such as uh, the Biblical Theology, Reformed 
uh, dog, uh, dog manics and so much more in store for you. Uh, I've recently ordered now uh, one of their books that they're selling and they're a great service. Uh, they're very accommodating and all and um, uh, it's a blessing to have them also that we have uh, more and more Christian uh, booksellers in this time. So these are the commercial and these are the ministries and you can like them on Facebook to so, so support them and subscribe on their YouTube channels. Now we will go back to the show. So welcome back to the show. Uh, it's been a blessing to see all of you here. And uh, if you look into the commercials, uh, kindly look at them on Facebook, like them, support them. Uh, there are lots, tons of stuff that you can see and also uh, learn about. And also uh, you can purchase and buy from these people in that segment. So now I'm with Sight and Bergen Kate. And uh, we're going to talk about how to answer the fool. And we're going to answer some questions uh, based on uh, the people would say and people ask and also in my personal a point of view of my question. And Sai, so um, the third question is, I believe uh, you've already said this over and over again. I believe that you emphasize it uh, very clearly. But uh, can you give us also again the answer why the Bible is the greatest weapon we have in defending the faith? Uh, because the word of God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and... Um... When I do my talks as well, um, you know, I talk about the defense of the Word of God because in the film I play this clip of a famous apologist, and he said, "What can you not use to prove the Bible?" And the crowd of Christians yells out, "The Bible!" And I'll go to my conferences and I'll say, "What if I said I was the strongest man in the world?" I say, "You might have suspected it by looking at my body." And of course, there's a big laugh then. But I said, "What if I said, what can I not use to prove that I'm the strongest man in the world?" And they yell out, "Your strength." Since the Bible is what it claims to be, it must prove itself. Now, we don't say that the Bible is true because the Bible is true, but we say the Bible is true because it's the Word of God. He has revealed it to us, and if you reject it, your worldview is absurd. So why do we use the Bible? Because it's a revealed certain Word of God, and if you reject it, your worldview is foolish. Yeah. Uh, have you ever experienced, Sai, uh, I believe you have, uh, in people saying that not only evidence is in the Bible, if how can you be sure that the Bible is the supreme authority? Because many people would say you have the, the historical facts, the the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. They would they would seize them somehow and wouldn't still be convinced. And have you ever crossed into that? And how do you respond to these uh, types of people? Well, the thing is, I don't give evidences because if I give evidences, then the Bible is not self-attesting. Now, as a Christian, do I love these evidences? Of course, I love those evidences because I'm a Christian. But as we said in the first half, all evidences are interpreted according to what we already believe. Our Bible talks about a talking donkey. It talks about a man who was in a fish for three days. It talks about a man who was dead for three days and came back to life. If you reject God, that's absurd. But if you start with God, then I don't have to prove the truth of Scripture to you. So most Christians are out there trying to prove these miracles so that they prove the Bible is true. And I say, if you had a leather-bound original all 66 books of the Bible, the original, you found it in pristine condition, and you handed that to an unbeliever, he'd flip through it and go, talking donkey. You found the original of a fairy tale. And people are using paper fragments to try and prove the Bible's true, instead of starting with the truth of the Bible and saying, if you reject it, your worldview is absurd. Yeah. See, because God must first grant them repentance to open their eyes to the truth. If they repent for their sin against the God they know exists, I don't have to prove miracles to them, because God can do miracles. Man, hey man, uh, what you've said really makes the mark of the point how the Bible is the greatest weapon. And again, uh, it says in the Bible that the Bible is a double-edged sword that pierces through the hearts of people. Uh, by, that right. example, by that example, <laughs> we can see how exactly. powerful the Bible is. But somehow, Sai would say that they treat the Bible as not a sword, but rather than a toy sword. You know, like a, a kid's playing toy and sword. Yep. Somehow that they won't just uh, maybe I'll just share a bit of truths from you and then let's see if you think about it. And then we can discuss next time over coffee. And then I'll right. there are many. I, I have, this, I have this, uh, this, this talk on YouTube. It's apologetics is easy. Read your Bible and believe what it says. And if you go to my video where I answer uh, Matt Walsh, I go to some of those powerful verses because that's one thing that he mocked that assuming the truth of the Bible, but you can go to the, the Bible self attesting truth and if you go to that video, How to Answer Matt Walsh, you can see how I answer a lot of those questions. 
Yeah, so you can watch that on YouTube. Uh, what as I said, uh, it's all in the YouTube. All his debates, all the uh, documentaries he's made, how to answer the fool, debating the Hunty was there, and I was touched with that video of, of your uh, closing statement with the Hunty. Uh, it was a great. Well, not, not a lot of people know that story, but um, I preached a sermon the day after that debate at a local church, and I was tired from the doing the debate. And it was kind of emotional, and I ended that sermon in tears. And I, I walked off the, I walked from the podium and Marcus, uh, my friend who Marcus Pittman was filming, I looked at him and I said, do not use that scene because I didn't want myself to be crying on film. I've never said that to him before. I've never said to him since I said, do not use that scene. And then he sent me the final cut of the film and he finished the film with, with me in tears. And in retrospect, I'm happy that he did, but he totally defied my wishes. So. <laughs> it's a blessing disguise actually, I think. I shared, that, I shared that to my Instagram story that uh, you want to see who's my guest? Watch this video. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing, because there's a clip of just the end thing there. And um, yeah, like I said, I'm thankful. Marcus is a brilliant filmmaker. So is David. I mean, I'm just thankful to have them in my life. I think one thing, Sai, that I wasn't like really uh, seeing, it's just not Sai, is because you're wearing a suit and tie. <laughs> I think like, <laughs> not the Sai that I know. I'm just very sure. Yeah. Ten Brigancade, Sai Ten Brigancade, because when you say Sai Ten, especially people from Australia, they think I'm saying Satan. Satan. <laughs> so my last name is Ten Brigancade, so it's either Sai or Sai Ten Brigancade. That, but that Sai is, Ten does not sound good. That's the <laughs> thing that people can say to your name, Satan. Because <laughs> I spoke at a conference once, and um, uh, there were books in the lobby by Corey Ten Bohm. Ah. And she wrote, you know, she wrote The Hiding Place, and... Uh, I said, I, I see that you have some books in, in the, uh, on the book table by uh, Corey Bohm. And they said, oh, it's 10 Bohm. I said, why do you leave it off of my name? You know, or I'll say Corey 10, you know, no. So the last name, it's a 10 is a prefix in Dutch, like van or de. So my whole last name, I know it's a mouthful, but my whole last name is Ten Bruggenkate. Oh, I, I'm just going to ask, is Corey Ten Bohm a relative? <laughs> <laughs> well, she's Dutch. So, you know, we're related way back, you know, Noah or Adam. <laughs> I would just want to jump into the story. Uh, I've heard when you're in Australia, uh, you've said that there that people doesn't like are welcoming. I don't know that story. I don't know that. I don't know. You've said that a couple of. I, I heard in Australia. That. Sorry, I, you, I, you cut out there. Yeah, it, there was one time in Australia. You were Australia. How's your? I was just gonna ask. How's your experience in Australia? <laughs> I don't know the story you're talking about. I went there. I, you know, this was before the ministry, and I did scuba diving. I have a brother that lives down there, but I'm not. I don't. I'm not thinking about the story you're talking about. You have to refresh my memory. Yeah, I think uh, someone said. I don't know if this is true. I, I'm hearing <laughs> I'm here just as true that uh, I think um, people are in Australia are not that friendly. I, I, I like, like people would just ignore you. Just don't know who you are. I don't know that story if it's true or not. No, no. Before, when I was in Australia, that was before uh, the ministry, so people wouldn't have known me back there. But um, usually, I'm, if I'm recognized, it's usually by unbelievers that recognize me. There's a video of me in Balboa Park in uh, San Diego, and um, a group took me to the atheist table, and I was debating like I normally do with these atheists, and somebody came up to me and said, you're no Psy. He said, he's more obnoxious than you are, but he's a lot better at this than you are. And I said, I'm no Psy? Really? I said, do you know what he looks like? What would you say to him? And that actually, that video is somewhere on YouTube. It's called You're No Psy. Oh, yeah. And so, but yeah, when I was in Australia, um, actually, I think the people are, are, I think the people in Australia are a lot more, because I'm from Canada, a lot more like Canadians than they are, than Canadians are like Americans or Australians are like Americans. So I think they're very similar. I'm actually shocked at um, what the Australians are allowing to happen with COVID. You know, because the, the clamp down on COVID in Australia has been crazy. And I think these people are rednecks and they're allowing this to happen. But now I'm seeing that they're starting to revolt. But I, I just found it unbelievable that the, the lengths that the Australians were allowing the government to run over them with their crazy COVID regulations. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen and heard a lot of churches in Australia that are having a hard time meeting together. And they're somehow restricting people meeting together in church. So it's a hard time. It's great for our brothers in Australia. They're having a hard time, really, um, in, on that aspect. And yeah, you heard I said, yeah, I, I would agree what you said. It's happening in Australia. Pretty sad. Yeah, but no, when I visited there, it was great. I did a lot of scuba diving. The first time I went down, I was there for five months, and I borrowed my brother's ute. They, that's what they call a utility vehicle. And uh, 
It's a Toyota 4Runner. I loved it. I put like 5,000 kilometers on it. I went up and down the coast scuba diving. And uh, yeah, I, would, I wasn't doing ministry back then. Did you try scuba diving in Palawan? I'd love to, man. You invite me and I'm there. Okay, let's do it. I'm going to set that. <laughs> Next year. If you're gonna Send the plane ticket too. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to come here. Yeah, sure. I, I, let's, uh, we can plan on that. But the one who said in Australia, the one my friend said that, I'll talk to you later on. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm not familiar with that. The thing is, a lot of times the stories, they, they get garbled. And uh, so um, I'm not sure which story that is. But, you know, if he remembers, then he can ask me. and Maybe we can uh, do another show. So. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I would love to have you on the show in the, the podcast hmm. uh, in, in, in this because uh, I have many friends. I told them that you're going to be on the show. They're really excited. They're like. They're screaming. I usually tell them to raise their standards. <laughs> <laughs> I think, but I think uh, this will be probably the best episode you have because you're in a good venue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The really nice studio. Although somebody just walked in, but uh, he saw me here and he backed up. It wasn't Eric. So <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah. So, you know, as I, um, uh, I would really would love to talk to you more, but you know, time is catching up on us. And I'm going to say thank you so much for being the show, Sai. Uh, I believe that uh, we can do a partnership your collaboration next time and invite you on the show uh, again. Uh, maybe you can also share your, uh, we can also share your uh, stories and also at the same time, apologetics. Uh, you know, Eric can come here with this closing statement. He can just come in anytime. But the- he walked out. He's not here anymore. So. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. <laughs> the last- yeah, but uh, sorry, go on. Uh, but the last question is, uh, what is your encouragement for Christians who are doubting in their faith or are afraid in defending their faith? And also words for atheists on why they should turn to Christ as their source for truth and as their Lord. As far as Christians who are doubting, one thing that I want to encourage Christians that doubt, I say, what is necessary to doubt God? In order to doubt God, you need truth because you're doubting the truth of his existence. In order to doubt, you need logic. Because without logic, the making sense of doubts doesn't make any sense. In order to doubt, you need what's known as the uniformity of nature, that nature must behave uniformly or doubts make no sense. And I say all of these things, and of course, there's many other things that you need to doubt, but all of these things like truth, like knowledge, like logic, what is necessary for all of those things? God is necessary for all of those things. So I I encourage unbelievers who are experiencing doubt, do you know what is necessary to doubt God? You need God to doubt God. And the Bible says everyone is certain that God exists, even the unbelievers. And the reason to turn to him is because they're facing an eternal damnation. And, and, you know, a lot of times um, I'll run into people on the street and they say they can't wait to get to hell. They'll be partying with their friends. They'll be able to get away from God. But what they don't understand is that Satan does not rule in hell. God rules in hell. And I'm not saved from Satan. I'm saved from the wrath of Almighty God. And that's why I ask people to, to, to repent and put their trust in Jesus Christ so they can have an eternity in heaven with God. Now, I don't, you know, when I'm on the street, I tell people that they must repent. But then I also explain what it is because a lot of people don't understand what repentance is. And this is the question that I ask them, and I'll ask them on the street. Is repentance something you say, something you think, or something you do? And most Christians will say repentance is something you do. But repentance actually comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change your mind. Repentance is actually something you think. So the unbeliever needs to change what they think about God. And the question is, how do you do that? And the Bible says you can't. It says repentance is the gift of God. So what the unbeliever needs to do is to cry out to God and ask him to change their mind about him so that they come to know the peace that they all understand, that they can know salvation in Jesus Christ. And if they know that, it will change what they say and change what they do. So repentance is actually all three, but it starts with a change of mind. And they need to cry out to God and ask him to save them by the blood of Jesus Christ. And people say, oh, how often do they do that? Do I do that? And I say, you do that until the day you die and he casts you into hell or until the day that he saves you because God is worthy. But I want to encourage people who are out there who are unbelievers that God will turn no one away when they ask in sincerity. So I encourage people to get on their knees and cry out to the God they know exists and ask him to save them by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Sai and Bergen Kate, for being on the show. It's a blessing. Hope that I can invite you in the future. I hope this will be the end 
or the beginning of a partnership in the ministry somehow uh, through this podcast. So you can connect. Uh, you can also share now uh, how they can connect to you, how uh, what your websites are. You can also promote uh, your uh, Patreon. Yeah, well, my website is Proof That God Exists with an S, proofthatgodexists.org. And I have a couple of YouTube channels. Um, one of them is um, Proof That God Exists. That's most of my debates and open air preaching. And my other YouTube channel is called Answer Anyone. And that's where How to Answer the Fool, Debating Dilla Hunty, How to Answer Matt Walsh is there. And my Patreon, again, is Patreon, patreon.com slash be for those people who want to support me. And um, that would also be much appreciated. And thanks so much uh, for having me on, Mr. Sai. <laughs> yes, I'm Mr. Sai. Do you say it? Do you say it like that? No, well, it's C. Oh, okay. That's too bad. You have to change that. <laughs> I'm gonna put an E in it in the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sai. All right. I hope. Uh, is Eric there? I, I no, he's know. gone. Oh, he's gone. But maybe I'll try. I'll try and uh, convince him to go on one of your shows at a later date. But um, I, I, when I told him that that um, I was gonna be in his studio, I said they'd probably ha- rather have him on than me. So, uh, and that's probably the case. I think that he's probably known down in the Philippines, whereas I'm not, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think I forgot to quote it's uh, preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. And I'm quite happy with that. Amen. Amen. You know, it's going to be an honor if you're going to be in the Philippines with Eric or without Eric or Eric himself will come to the Philippines. Uh, we're going to have, uh, it's going to be a fun time, going to be a great time to be uh, when you're going to go to the Philippines. Looking forward to that. All right. Stay tuned for more episodes. We will be having Dr. Samson Uitanlet from the Biblical Seminary of the Philippines. We'll be talking about the multidimensional pastor. And also like us on Facebook. Help us to reach a thousand likes. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Just Faith Library PH, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Just Faith Library. For now, this is Aaron. See you all and God bless.